TikTok. We love it. We hate it. We love to hate it. And every social media platform apparently wants to imitate it. Go check out my YouTube shorts if you haven't. Some of them are really funny. Today, we're going through some of my recent favorite TikToks. Some of them are funny. Some of them are learning. All of them will leave you um, having watched them in this video. That was the best intro I've ever done. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think I forgot how to make videos. Just make sure nice and comfortable and I'm gonna come in now. Is there a draft in here or is it me? Yeah, it does feel pretty breezy. Hang on, are we about to? Why did you keep your socks on? That's so embarrassing. I didn't know what to do, I panicked. Oh, what? I thought this was a date. I can't believe you made me bald for this. Oh, chill out, it's just hair. I feel really self-conscious. Do you reckon she's noticed her? Do I look normal? She's gonna think we don't know how to shave properly. Oh, as if she's gonna care. Guys, please, what if she thinks I look weird? Stop being such an attention seeker. You're normal. Oh, no, I think I need to pee. We literally went before we came in here. Yeah, but I feel a bit nervous now. Well, we'll be done in a minute, so just hold it. I feel like she's staring at me. I don't like this. This feels like an invitation. No! Oh my God, we're gonna fart in the nurse's <gasps> face. I can just get you to relax. It'll make it easier. Oh, what is it? What? Shout out to Haley Georgia Morris. She frequently makes videos like this that crack me up, but also include some really important points that I can make as a gynecologist. And for this one, that is, your doctor doesn't care. People always ask me if they should shave or they come in for their period. Should you douche before? The answer is always no to that one. Just no in general to douching ever. But all of these things just really don't matter. My answer is always just be nice to the staff and show up on time. That's that's all I need. That is truly all I need. Ah, oh, love it. Welcome back. Six weeks, eh? Doesn't time fly? Um, so, how are you getting on? Yeah, fine. Oh yes, I know. It's magical. Such a special time. You've never felt love like it. Blah, 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 blah. But I know there's only so much joy you can feel on NFS. Sorry, what? No fucking sleep. Plus, let me just have a quick look. Yeah, thought so. Seven stitches. Ah, oh, love. I bet those seven stitches feel a bit like you're dragging your bare labia across a carpet of broken glass, don't they? Yes! And I bet they also feel like they're the only thing that's stopping your vagina from flopping onto the floor right now, don't they? Yes, exactly. I know, darling. Now then, how's feeding going? <laughs> oh, I just, I don't, mean, oh, don't worry, darling. I know making sentences is hard right now. Let me take a quick guess. You're trying to breastfeed because Janet down the road has told you how natural it is. Fuck her. But your nipples feel like they're being sewn off by a rusty bread knife. Oh, yes. And I can tell you categorically when it comes to deciding whether you're going to give it formula or throw it out of the fucking window I can guarantee formula on balance less damaging <laughs> That creator is not so smug now and I absolutely love that since I moved to Aotearoa, New Zealand I have gotten a for you page that is coordinated for the rest of the world besides the US and I've been introduced to so many new creators who I had never seen before. This is a really great video, I think, because there's so much stigma around admitting that you're having trouble after you have a baby or that you're maybe not experiencing this as the most joyful moment in your life. And that's okay. You all have to make do. It is hard being postpartum. Feeding is hard. Healing is hard. Not sleeping is extremely hard. All of these things are hard and you're allowed to think that that is hard and you're even allowed to feel like this isn't your favorite time in motherhood or fatherhood or parenthood or whatever. It's okay. And for the record, categorically agree. Formula, throw the baby out the window, always formula. My stance on formula feeding is I don't really like the fed is best narrative or the breast is best narrative. I think both of these are harmful extremes that really lose the nuance of the conversation. So formula can be best in certain circumstances. Of course, if we're only looking at nutritional value, then breast milk is always going to win there. But there's so many more things that come into breastfeeding, including how are you mentally doing? Is baby gaining weight? Are you both feeling good about this? Because if it becomes a point where you're trying to breastfeed and it's interfering with your ability to bond with baby or enjoy baby, or you're at your breaking point mentally, and you think adding formula or completely switching to formula would help with that, that is the best thing for you, in which case formula is best. I think that using this extremist two box language in any discussion is detrimental from the abortion discussion to formula feeding, to how you should birth or where you should birth. Always, 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 Nuance matters. Cause I've been living life right like I could just die any minute. Go for a ride down the side. PCH got your limit. I don't need a guide. Follow lights. Take me where I wanna visit. Are you? This account is called.
called period harmony and every single one of their videos uses this incredible uterus puppet and I am in love with it. I don't even know if I'll be able to include that one because it might get copyright claimed, but I just love the puppet. Would love to procure one for myself. If any of you know where to get a uterus puppet, let me know. And I miss my lover. <laughs> this is from X Lil Soup, and I love that video because that was legitimately me in my first pregnancy. And for the record, it's fine. They all get out, and it usually is just gonna be perfectly okay. So try not to stress too much. Today, I learned something about pregnancy that will make it so that I can never look at plates the same way. After the baby is born um, and the placenta falls out or is ripped out, it depends. Okay, we don't rip out a placenta. That doesn't happen, okay? The placenta comes out. In certain cases, if it's really stuck, it might have to be manually removed, but that is not typically how a placenta comes out. It leaves a uh, dinner size plate wound that then has to heal over. So like, see like the inner lip part of this? Like that circumference. That's Even just the outer part. Bleeding out of cross. There's people who just gave birth that the doctors are making walk around with dinner plate sized boo-boos inside of their bodies. Horrifying. Okay, so I wanted to do this one because I see this all the time and it drives me nuts. I've been wanting to talk about this for a really long time. And the reason is because people seem to use this as like, oh my gosh, you have a dinner plate sized wound in your uterus. And like, yeah, kind of, but the actual thing here is that a placenta is about the size of a dinner plate. So average placenta, maybe about this big, maybe even a little bit bigger, honestly. And when it comes out, it does technically leave a wound on the backside. So where it was connected to the uterus, those blood vessels have to break in order to release it. However, we need to talk about what immediately happens to the uterus after the baby and the placenta exit through the birth canal or through the sunroof. This balloon's gonna pop before I get it to the size of a 39 week uterus. about the average size of a uterus at full term before the baby comes out of it, okay? Pretend this is the size of the placenta. Placenta. So you have placenta on the inside of a uterus, baby comes out, placenta comes out. And then immediately, thanks to the lovely hormone called oxytocin, your uterus does this. Over the next few weeks, it gets all the way down to this. So just like the size of my drawing shrunk immediately and then shrunk even more significantly over the next week, your uterus and the placenta wound on the inside also shrinks. And now I have marker all over me, so awesome. Excellent job. Yes, there is a large wound on the inside, but it's a wound that your body is created to deal with. It's not like I stabbed you or cut off a plate-sized area of your body. It's something that your body is perfectly aligned to deal with. So yes, this is true. And yes, that is about the average size of a placenta, but it's not as horrific as people make it sound when they make videos like this. Pick somebody else. Pick somebody else. I don't, I'm not. I'm Hi, um, in case you didn't know it, they actually bumped the age for your first pap from 21 to 25. So you can wait three more years to do it. Don't worry, you're fine. So this is kind of true. The United States Preventative Services Task Force still recommends screening for pap smears to start at the age of 21. The American Cancer Society has said screening with primary HPV testing that is FDA approved can start at 25. So there's some discrepancy here. The reason that there's some discrepancy is because over screening has harms, including more colposcopies, more biopsies, more need for intervention if someone has a lesion that might have cleared on its own by 25, but under screening can have some harms too. 
only about 1% of cervical cancers are diagnosed under the age of 25, but that is still a percentage that we would be missing. You have to have a cutoff somewhere. So I think this is a discussion to be had with your healthcare provider based on your risk. Are you vaccinated against HPV? How many partners have you had? If you've never had a sexual partner, then it makes a lot more sense to wait longer. But if you've had several sexual partners and you're not vaccinated, then it probably makes sense to go ahead and initiate screening a little bit earlier. So this isn't a hard and fast age 25 rule just yet. It might be eventually, but right now I do think it's still important to make that appointment, come in and at least have a chat about it with your doctor or advanced practice provider. Hey, baby number three. We're 10 in minutes hospital. before I went into cardiac monitor. arrest. Just to make sure you're safe, there's your handsome dad. Chest compressions to the nearest OR. We still don't know what we're having. So Second IV comes boy. out, no doctor on the floor, Not no sure. anesthesia. Um, but a nurse yells, someone get face. this baby and out. She's been snuggle. down for seven minutes. I have uh, my epidural in. Of course, you don't understand No doc, no IV, no anesthesia. And just 15 I'm nurses running around waiting for someone to get my baby on the out. Over here. And ER doc magically shows up. ER docs so, don't go to yeah. floor codes. Someone a get me a scalpel, today. he We're says. Just saying prayers, and we have a lot of people praying over us that you come out good. And he thought healthy. I was already dead, and, and he was coming to do a post-mortem so, C-section, he told my husband. We love you very much, and your two eager sisters are waiting. Harper's in school, and Hadley's with my sister, Michelle. So, um, it's going to be exciting. Love you. Oh. So this is from an account called Before You Push, and this is a description of her experience with amniotic fluid embolism. So we wanna talk a little bit about amniotic fluid embolism, and I know this is a heavier TikTok, but I thought it was a good opportunity for learning, and I know that she is trying to bring some awareness to this topic. Amniotic fluid embolism is not an embolism like you would think of where you get a blood clot that goes somewhere, particularly the lungs. Amniotic fluid embolism is where amniotic fluid extravasates, meaning goes from inside the uterus through the blood vessels into the maternal circulation and causes an anaphylactic type reaction that is extremely serious and oftentimes causes somebody to acutely become critically ill and a lot of times to code like she's talking about. And that means her heart stopped and they started doing chest compressions to try and save her life. The mortality rate for amniotic fluid embolism is very high because it is rare and hard to study and even then understudied because of that and just because everything in this field is understudied, but also because it happens very acutely and quickly, often in somebody who really doesn't have any identifiable risk factors. And so this is something that I have personally seen and it is very scary and the outcomes are not always very good. She talks about having what they told her husband was a post-mortem C-section. So when somebody's heart stopped while they are pregnant, you have about 10 minutes to get the baby out if you have any hope of keeping the baby alive. Also, doing that, removing the baby, usually through a bedside C-section, just scalpel to baby and get it out in minutes, usually will also help the pregnant person because getting the baby out drastically increases the blood flow that can go like into the maternal circulation. So this is really important for both potentially saving the life of the baby, but also saving the life of the person who is coding. I don't want anybody to leave fearful of this because it's extremely rare, but I do think Before You Push is doing a good job of sharing her story and talking about it. So if you wanna go check out her TikTok, be a good place to learn. And if you have any questions about it, you can leave your comments down below for me. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope that you learned something. I hope that you got a laugh. If you are new here and you'd like to subscribe, we'd love to have you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you never miss an upload. I will see you next Monday.